So, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to the conference part of the day. My name is Olaf Mertelsmann. I'm Associate Professor in Contemporary History at the University of Tartu. Um, as a bit of information for those who do not understand Estonian. If questions are asked later in Estonian, you might need headphones. But our entire meeting will be officially held in English. I open this conference on the heritage in 21st century Europe of the crimes committed by communist regimes. And you might wonder why on a day which is a day of commemoration of the, the Hitler-Stalin Pact, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the German-Soviet Pact of Non-Aggression, why to speak just about communist regimes, and you will get the answer during the next one and a half hours. It's not me who gave the title to our meeting. Um, allow me to open the floor for the first just five minutes long speech of Mr. Urmas Reinsalu, Minister of Justice of the Republic of Estonia. Thank you. Thank you, dear fellow Europeans. I'm privileged to uh, receive you here in Tallinn, Estonia, uh, in that day. Just um, eight years ago, on uh, 2009, the uh, European Parliament adopted the resolution on European conscience and totalitarianism. The resolution called for the proclamation of uh, this precise date, 23rd August, as Europe-wide day of remembrance for the victims of all totalitarian and authoritarian regimes to be commemorated with dignity and impartiality. But it was noted in the resolution that the Europe will not be united unless it's able to form a common view, a common view of its history, recognizes Nazism, Stalinism, and fascist and communist regimes as a common legacy, and brings about an honest and thorough debate on the crimes in the past century. The end of quotation. And this is a basis of the commemoration of uh, Pan-European uh, uh, Commemoration Day we are having uh, today here in Tallinn. And the basis is a strong condemnation of all crimes against humanity and the massive human rights violations committed by all totalitarian and authoritarian regimes and remembrance the victims of all the, of these regimes. And uh, this is not a political issue, but this is an issue of uh, human rights, of human dignity, we respect, and a legal issue. The, rem the remembrance is based on, on the Nuremberg Principles, on the United Nations Convention on the Non-Applicability of Statutory Limitations to War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity, on the resolutions of the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, European Parliament Resolution, and several other statements. And let me stress that uh, in Estonia, we have historically experienced the occupations of two totalitarian regimes, both the communist as well as the Nazi regime. And similar experience has been shared by several uh, other European countries. So whereas crushing the National Socialist regime in the spring of uh, 1945 meant freedom from the horrors of the Nazi terror regime from Western and Southern Europe to the fate of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania was different. 
Literally, the agreement between Stalin and Hitler dated from the 23rd of the August 1939 to leave the Baltic states to the Soviet Union, and it remained in force. So uh, the communist regime continued in form of the Soviet occupation. Only in Estonia, this regime claimed tens of thousands of victims, even after the end of the Second World War, and the crimes committed by this regime have left the traces that one can still find in the 21st century. And this is the issue we are going to handle uh, today, taking a pan-European perspective. Therefore, uh, the conference taking place on 23rd August, right now in Tallinn, has been dedicated to the investigating of the legacy of the crimes committed by the communist regime. And from the perspective of Estonia, uh, that era has ended only 26 years ago. Within the framework of the Remem Remembrance Day, European ministers of justice and representatives of associations of victims of totalitarianism, as well as representatives of state and private institutions and organizations, that study the crimes of totalitarian regimes and record remembrance of victims of such regimes convene in European capitals uh, every year on uh, 23rd August. And th this year's meeting takes place in Tallinn for the second time ever. And let me stress that um, when we met last time in Tallinn, there was also adopted a joint statement uh, of the conference uh, uh, which also addressed clearly that uh, there is a need also uh, uh, for uh, justice, justice uh, concerning uh, uh, the uh, investigation and prosecution of the crimes of communist regimes. Uh, and uh, we stated two years ago that it's been, it has been insufficient and inconsistent uh, uh, in, in, uh, across countries. And uh, we started a working group. Also, we started a working group also to uh, study possibilities to uh, um, establish a supranational uh, uh, cooperation in that field. And I'm uh, I'm happy to announce also today that uh, with a group of uh, uh, like-minded uh, countries, we made today conclusions uh, that. Uh, uh, we found that uh, under the communist dictatorships in Europe, hundreds of thousands of innocent people were executed, killed, imprisoned, tortured, forced by, to perform slave labor, or deported. At no process of true finding and justice comparable to that staged by the international community after World War II against the perpetrators of Nazi crimes has been undertaken during the more than 25 years that have uh, passed since the fall of the communist regimes in Eastern and Central Europe. And so uh, we found it important uh, uh, that the memory of the victims of the communist regimes demands the investigation and prosecution of the perpetrators of those crimes. And uh, it is important to strengthen international cooperation in bringing to justice all perpetrators of crimes against uh, humanity. And therefore, uh, we uh, agreed to continue cooperation for the uh, establishment of uh, further uh, supranational cooperation. And uh, let me wish uh, success to the conference. And this is a uh, responsibility for our generation, <clears throat> responsibility which uh, we have to carry out with dignity of the past and handling of past is very important because we have to give it also to the future generations. The freedom makes us uh, free, and the basis of freedom is truth. So, great success to the conference. Thank you. The next speaker is Tuna Kelam member of the European Parliament, and he asked me not to mention all his other activities, but he was one of the important figures in Estonia's struggle for independence.
good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for coming to Tallinn. I, I feel that uh, we should be very much encouraged by the presence of uh, numerous member states, their legal representatives in Tallinn, to address this long postponed uh, heritage of uh, communist totalitarian crimes and how to assess these deeds. And my motto could be one of the conclusions of the European Commission seven years ago, which was titled, Your past is our common past. I think it should be our ideal goal. The columnist Mark Riley from Financial Times at the, at the beginning of this year compares the communist experiments under the pretext of healing a human society with medieval bloodletting practice, the cupping. The problem is that the practice in question is continuing to this very day, despite more than ample evidence that as a medieval method of healing, the bloodletting has clearly caused more harm than good. Communist totalitarian experiments during the past 100 years, it's important that at the end of this year, one could mark a century from communist practice, have all been accompanied or resulted in massive bloodletting. 100 years has caused more victims than all the other dictatorships together. The rough estimate of human cost is about 100 million, as expressed several years ago in the Black Book of Communism. That means, in the average, one million victims for every year from the century of communist practice. But even more sobering is the fact that this massive bloodletting had no, has had no healing effect on societies put by force into the role of patience. On the contrary, the Marxist-Leninist dogma, which was enforced as a rule by exceptional intolerance and violence, resulted in catastrophic worsening of the situation of a society to be healed. The strengthening of certain organs of the societal organism took place at the expense of deliberate and reckless weakening of its other parts. And we all know what will happen to any human organism when it is, uh, it is led out of balance, even in a very moderate way. So, for example, in 1959, the living standards of Cuba and South Korea were comparable. After 58 years of communist experiments in Cuba, South Korea exceeds Cuban, Cubans by living standards by five times. I think we all have to come to conclusion that every tree should be assessed, measured by its fruits. Those are fruits of the communist totalitarian experiments are there. These are victims. And the question is now, what have we to do with these results? To hide them, forget about them, or try to address, face them as they are? The Prague Declaration, now nine years ago from 2008, which prepared the ground for the next year's European Parliament Declaration resolution on, on communism and totalitarianism, calls for an all-European understanding that both the Nazi and communist totalitarian regimes each be judged by their own terrible merits. They were destructive in their policies of systematically applying extreme forms of terror. 
suppressing all civic and human liberties, starting aggressive wars, and as an inseparable part of their ideologies, exterminating and deporting the whole nations and groups of population. As such, they should be considered to be, to be the main disasters which blighted the 20th century. Question is, why communism is even today assessed as being different? Well, the results, the human costs, are exactly the same. The human suffering, injustice, murdering, murders, and all the rest. And victims who have been left, who are still living. I think it's interesting to quote the change in President Truman's mind who attended the Potsdam Conference as a new, fresh president without any experience, and who wrote after Potsdam to his daughter, we are now faced with exactly the same situation with which UK and France were faced in 1938-39 with Hitler. A totalitarian state is no different whether you called it Nazi, fascist, communist, or Franco-Spain. The Russian oligarchy is a Frankenstein dictatorship, worse than any of the others, Hitler included, says Wright Truman. I went to Potsdam with the kindliest feelings toward Russia. In a year and a half, they cured me of it. The European Parliament's resolution was mentioned here. I think it's very important that we were able to achieve such a resolution. It was not an easy task. But even more difficult is to carry it out. And that's why we are here today because declarations and resolutions are very important. But the European Union's main problem is how to, is about implementation. And always the devil is in details. Excuses, practical problems, legal difficulties, and of course, unanimity. But, uh, our Minister of Justice, Urmas Reinsal, just quoted one of the basic conclusions, which is important, really, in the European Parliament's resolution, that the memory of European tragic past has to be kept alive in order to express respect to victims, condemn perpetrators of crimes, and third, lay foundations for reconciliation, but reconciliation based on truth and commemoration. And as Urmas has said, United Europe is possible only when we'll be able to reach a common understanding of history, common understanding of history, recognize both communism and Nazism as our common historic heritage and conduct an honest and thorough debate on all totalitarian crimes of the 20th century. The European Parliament also believes that a thorough reassessment of European history, together with recognition of all historic aspects of contemporary Europe, will strengthen the European integration. That is a positive message. And now, what is practical call? and here are representatives of, of governments of the U European Union. European Parliament calls on the European Council and also Commission to support and protect the activities of those NGOs that actively investigate and collect facts and documents on Stalinist crimes. Uh, so one of the, there are two concrete outlets of the European Parliament's resolution. One was to commemorate 23rd of August, 
as an all-European day of commemoration of all victims of totalitarian regimes. The other was to create a European platform, platform on, on, of conscience and memory. And once again, Parliament calls for strengthening of fin financial support for initiatives mentioned above. The European Platform of Conscience and Memory was founded two years later, in 2011. Its chairman, Jöran, is, uh, is sitting here. And uh, I would like to turn attention to his activities because he is a well-known Swedish politician, was Chairman of Political Committee of the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly conducted a resolution on, on totalitarianism in the Council of Europe and is heading now the activities of European Platform of Conscience and Memory. The problem is that this has been created. It's official and still it has to face the dilemma of Hamlet, to be or not to be, because money is absolutely scarce. It is supposed to coordinate efforts and activities of governmental and non-governmental organizations with the aim of documenting and researching past crimes and raising the awareness of the EU citizens, says the European Parliament. Nothing similar has been happening because the money is not forthcoming. And this is, this is now the call, how to unite all the European institutions to achieve a credible progress to solve these problems. European Commission's report seven years ago, which I mentioned on perpetuating of the memory of totalitarian crimes, supports also mar marking the day of rem remembrance of all victims of all totalitarian regimes in all member states. And that's too important, in all member states. Only a small minority of member states today is marking this. The horror of memories of the past must become an incentive for a joint effort of all member states to realize in practice that your past is our common past, declares the European Commission. Commission. Now, today, as it was said, 30 years ago, the first Estonian open-air political demonstration under the Soviet rule took place. It was called the Deer Park demonstration, and it was on purpose designed to take place on 23rd of August to mark the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact anniversary. Why? Because we've been told that Estonia in 1940 joined voluntarily the big Soviet Union, and there were rumors that in fact it happened as a result of between two dictators who divided Europe into the zones of influence. And this demonstration started the process of finding out first the truth. The truth was public, became public a year ago, a year later. And here in the case of Estonia and other Baltic states, really it became true that truth makes you free. The understanding that we were not in legal marriage with the Soviet Union gave us moral, political ground to ask for restoration of independence. Still, today, we can speak about the mental Berlin Wall in Europe. And it's alarming how long it has been able to exist. 
now 28 years after the demolishing of the physical Berlin Wall. I think our address today to the specifically to the European Council should be take down this wall finally. Pope John Paul II addressing the European Parliament for the first time said that Europe must start to freely breathe with its both lungs, the lung of Western Europe and the lung of Eastern Europe. The Eastern European lung was blocked, suspended in free breathing for tens of years. But the same applies for the perception of this dark and bloody period seen from the West. I think now it is high time that Western part of Europe should restart the breeze actively with its lung of memory, perception and conscience, the lung that is still partially blocked. First of all, it goes about basic principles upon which the whole European unification and cooperation is based. It goes about equality and solidarity. Equality and equal dignity of all the victims. There can be no second and first class victims, but in fact there are, with it, with it, without any official classification, of course. But one category of victims has been promised long time ago, never again. The other category of communist victims, there are no such guarantees. Such guarantees that can arise only from the EU's collective authoritar authoritative, authoritative political and moral assessment of crimes against humanity committed by communist regimes. The assessment of communist crimes cannot be delegated to subsidiarity level. Let each, the understanding has been that let each country which has experienced communist totalitarianism deal itself with its past. It's not our European problem. And I must say that most depressing surprise 13 years ago when there was a big bang of European enlargement and also the Baltic states entered the European Union was the indifference, the lack of interest, the deafening silence even about our past. Yes, we know that you had difficult past. You had experienced many bad things, but now we are together. Let's leave this past behind and proceed together toward a better future. It's not possible. And the time has shown that the problem of communist totalitarian crime, injustice, and problem of millions of victims is not going to automatically fade away. Such a hope was cherished for several years after the Big Bang of enlargement. Problem of tens of millions of new citizens of the U European Union. But Freedom to travel, better living standards, cannot substitute truth and dignity and e equality. In reality, we can now see that injustice and crimes not addressed has often gone underground and is seeking other outlets, often in the form of populist and even leftist movements. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact is significant to show how extremes tend to merge. Stalin and Hitler, who was left, who was right? Actually, there was no difference. Both wanted to conquer the world. Both wanted a deal to better advance their own interests. And today, in the European Parliament, we see the same kind of merger, communists, leftists, and on the other hand, the Front National, Independence Party of UK. In 75, 
percent of cases vote in the similar way. You can see on both wings of the parliament there are red color or green color, but they coincide in the interests to undermine and demolish democ democratic rule, rule of law society. And finally, my final remark is about the practical need of addressing these problems together. That is, that comes to Mr. Putin. If there had been the same kind of assessment, political and moral assessment, of course, we, we, we have never spoken about collective punishment. The moral and political assessment of communist crimes, as it happened in 1948-45, about Nazi crimes, we would not have to deal to get today with Mr. Putin. Because as, as it is impossible today in Germany to have a chancellor who was a member of Gestapo, it would have impossible to have a Russian Federation leader which was a member of the notorious KGB, responsible for perpetrating the most of totalitarian crimes in the Soviet Union. So this is a price, very big price we need to pay today, the price of consuming our time, our attention every day in dozens of capitals, in foreign ministries, the name Putin, what he has done, what he is going to do, is depressing our activities and thoughts. If we had done what is needed to be do, then we would be free of it. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Mr. Kellam. I guess there is already enough material for thinking and debating, and we will soon start. But as a historian, allow me a very small remark. Um, a common understanding of history. If we all had a common understanding of recent history, I would change my job, because history would be too boring for me. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, concerning today's anniversary, the Hitler-Stalin Pact, many people do not know that the British and the French government offered Stalin in their talks to reach a pact against Hitler with him, a sphere of influence from Finland to Turkey. So they offered actually more than Hitler. I mean Turkey. Um, so <coughs> it was not only the two evil dictators at that very time, but spheres of influence were common European political practice among great powers running colonial empires, which they did not run much better than the dictators their home countries. Just um, a remark from a historian concerning the complexity of history and that history is multifaceted. But now I stop, I introduce the participants of our podium discussion. Dr. Anna Kaminski from the Federal Foundation for the Study of the Communist Dictatorship in Eastern Germany. She uh, has researched everyday life in the GDR and worked a lot about memory and history. Second, Professor Andras Kasserkamp, now University of Toronto, a former colleague from the University of Tartu, and acclaimed for his 
History of the Baltic States. If you want, if you need an introduction, read his book. It's, it's a good one. Thank you. <laughs> Professor I Igor Kasiu from the State University of Moldova. He specialized in uh, the history of communism, World War II, the famous but unknown famine in post-World War II Moldova. And uh, this brings me to another thought. You mentioned the 100 million victims of communism, uh, quoted from um, the Black Book of Communism. But we should remember that the vast majority of them were famine victims. So if you look for socialism, you should always look at famines and malnutrition. And our last member in the panel is Dr. Bartosz Dziwanowski Stefanczuk. I apologized for my bad spell, <laughs> for my bad pronunciation from the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity. He is a historian, worked on Polish-German relationship, and of course, history and memory. So we have to kick off somehow, but <clears throat> I think Mr. Kellam delivered already a lot of thoughts. And uh, maybe, Andres, you could start as uh, the representative of Estonia here in the panel. <clears throat> Well, uh, <clears throat> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I thought I was now the North American representative. No, no, not. Yeah, your contract starts when? It started already. That's why it's in the program there. But um, I will discover when I move to Canada that they are having uh, difficulties, as I've read in the news and heard from the Estonian community, with uh, commemorating the victims of communism. Uh, there are plenty of citizens of Canada from all over the world, not just Eastern Europe, but from Asia in particular, who are also victims of, of communism. And there's been a very big public debate over uh, constructing a monument in the capital of Ottawa. Uh, there have been, was promised by the previous government, the new government has had second thoughts, there have been uh, much criticism as, which has been sort of disguised in that it's not direct ideological criticism, but maybe the architectural solution isn't the best or the location isn't the right one, but there does seem to be that sort of undercurrent as uh, Mr. Kellam was saying in his uh, introductory remarks, that also victims of communism are somehow second class or not worth as much attention, perhaps, as, as others. And it really has been up to these emigre or exile communities to try to, to push that issue. But it has also been perceived very much as a niche or ethnic minority type of question in that multicultural society, which isn't very helpful uh, because it seems like special interests are at play who are promoting their own special agenda of, of, of victimhood. And that doesn't help make it a general part of the Canadian narrative. In fact, uh, this year, of course, um, it's the 150th anniversary of Canada, which is just a little bit older than Estonia. Uh, and uh, a lot of the tension there, the public debate was about uh, how can it be 150? You're ignoring the, um, the First Nations, as they're known in, in, in Canada, that the indigenous peoples, that this 150 doesn't mark them. And a lot of attention, rightfully so, uh, has been uh, pointed at them. And these victims of communism have been, that's a very marginal uh, issue there. 
Um, but you asked me to say something about an Estonian point of view, yeah. and uh, I immediately jumped into my ro new role as a, as a Canadian once again. Um, but from the Estonian perspective, it's all, I've always admired the work of uh, Don Negelam and some of his younger colleagues like Ormas Reinsalo and, and Marco Michelson, who have for years been uh, uh, pushing uh, this at a European level because it hasn't been easy. It's met uh, resistance all along and it always has seemed like those, as Mr. Kalam was saying, 2004, we become members of the European Union and we are pushing our own agenda, uh, which, you know, get on with it, look towards the future, don't be too concerned. It's always uh, surprised me and, and Mr. Kalam at the end of his speech brought in the issue of Putin and, and Russia, and the relationship with Russia, which is always the issue which we get connected with. Whatever we do in Estonia, even the digital single market is somehow related to and things cyber uh, to Russia. We can't escape, escape that. But I think the key here is to make it into a sort of general universal issue regarding human rights and commemoration that it's not specifically, though it is in our case, uh, to do with um, our history, our tragic history and experience together with, with Russia. And of course, the, the key to all this, as, as uh, Tunne Gelam said at the end, would be also supporting those actors within Russian society, in Russia, who would uh, also um, realize that this is part of their own tragedy and it's important for the future of their own people and their own nation that the future generations are not indoctrinated only in the victory day, as Putin is uh, basing the Russian pride and nationalism today, but that Russians come themselves, naturally themselves, not with anyone from the outside telling them that they must do so. No new Nuremberg, that's not on the agenda, though there's a lot of people I know in these circles who who make that comparison with Nuremberg, but that's, I think, not an impossibility and not worth pushing. It's something that has to come from within uh, Russian society uh, itself. So there are brave activists who are dealing with this, and of course it's very difficult to encourage them because the Russian government has put in all this legislation about uh, NGOs who get funding are all of a sudden foreign agents. So it's, it's very difficult to cooperate and, and encourage them. Uh, but that's um, an area where Estonians have connections with their Russian colleagues um, and can sort of work together. But now I think I've gone on a bit long for an introduction. Thank you. Um, let's continue. Well, ladies first now. What is uh, your impression after the introductory remarks and and today's uh, different events of official speeches and so on. I would start with an article in a, a German um, newspaper in Berlin from last year. On 25th of August, two days after 23rd of August, this very large and, and important newspaper uh, published a small commentary uh, about the 23rd of August, writing uh, the Remembrance Day uh, nobody remembered. And for me, working in this field of history, uh, how to remember communist crimes, um, to make aware to German society or to the Westerners more or less as well, the blind side, the blind sides of, of our yeah, view on history. It was really impressing, and I wrote a, I, I wrote a letter to this uh, to this guy, and, and I asked him, okay, you are complaining that nobody remembered this day, but you as well didn't publish an article to remember the 23rd of August. Why? Why do you why do you write this commentary two days after? and not two days before. This year, we have a different situation. Uh, today, uh, this newspaper on the front page 
had an article about uh, the, the, the importance of 23rd of August and what does it mean to Germany and to, to Europe and not only to, to, to Eastern Europe. Because normally in Germany, at least uh, this is the impression I get from the discussions we have, uh, communism is something which belongs to East Europe. And we in, in Germany, we found a very good solution. We don't speak about communist dictatorship in, in Germany. We speak about the SED dictatorship. And this is a kind of decontextualize communism from German or from Europe's history. And also de to decontextualize the German experience from the experience of communism. And um, at the beginning of this year, because uh, um, Tony Kellam also mentioned that, that this year we are commemorating 100 years of communist dictatorships and communist regimes and communist crimes. And in this, uh, and, and, and we hoped uh, when we started our our campaign to remember what does it mean 100 years of communist uh, regimes in all over the world because um, it's often forget, forgotten that uh, communism was one of the most effective ideologies in the 19 in the 1980s uh, more than one third of uh, human mankind lived under communist powers and rules. So this is, uh, this is a tremendous uh, dimension. But in Germany, I would say it's an un unloved child. And uh, at the beginning of this year, we organized an international conference, and the, the title was uh, Blind Sides of uh, Historical Awareness, more or less. And this is communism. And I'm very thankful to, to Nikolam uh, also um, of his um, symbol of the mental Berlin Wall. Um, we often are using the, the saying that the former Iron Curtain was substituted by an Iron Curtain of Remembrance. In, in the West, the main, the main report is about Holocaust and Nazi crimes. And this is understandable because they didn't, they didn't had communist dictatorships. And in the East, we have both experiences to remember. And Germany is in between. And as Eastern Germany is only one fifth of German population, so also in Germany it is a minority experience. But how to make sure, or yes, and make, to make clear that uh, you shouldn't. You shouldn't divide anti-totalitarianism anti between uh, a good and a, and a bad yeah. totalitarian experience. The race of the victims. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and uh, please, uh, Mr. Kellam, could you join us in our discussion? Um, <coughs> uh, there is one chair reserved for you. Uh, OK. but. Let us continue our first round, Professor Karsu. Yeah, uh, Olaf, if you, if you want to continue as, as the previous, uh, to comment on what, uh, what uh, Mr. Tony Kellam uh, said, um, I think we are here and continuing what, what Anna started to say. I think we, we don't have yet a common conception of what means European memory uh, based uh, on on uh, on the day we are commemorating today, yes, the, the commemoration of the Nazi and communism. And here, I think, uh, if a distinguished member of the Parliament, European Parliament, uh, allow me to say that I, I think we should not uh, put this, like you said, the race or the wickedness or the the, the, the competition, which was worse. I think the numbers are not the, the only, uh, let's say, criteria. Because if you take numbers, and I'm not so smart to say that, it was Alan Besançon uh, to say that 
uh, and I totally agree, and I, I would like uh, to share this idea, and probably uh, some of you already know, of course. Uh, he's saying if you compare numbers of the victims, it's very simple. And the, the conclusion is simple, which was the greatest evil. But then comes another question, and this is deadlock, because it's about suffering, how you measure suffering. What is more evil, to be killed in a gas chamber, to be executed, to be starved to death, as in uh, Ukraine, but also Russia in the 30s, Kazakhstan, in, in Moldova, Ukraine and Russia after the Second World War. Uh, so I think uh, this conception of the European memory related to the totalitarian and authoritarian regimes in the 20th century should be based on this consensus. That they, and Alain Besançon said that, they were, they, they were both Nazi and communist regimes, they were equally criminal. So if we agree on that, we can, we can uh, build uh, a future tomorrow. And, and liquidating this mental uh, iron curtain that still is dividing uh, Europe in terms of memory. Again, I'm forced to remark one tiny little bit um, where well, history is not so much black and white, but mainly different tones of gray. I, I did not say shades of gray, I, I said tones. Um, during the post war famine in the Soviet Union, uh, the American government knew about it and stopped food aid. They stopped food aid. I, would, I could comment on that, okay. So uh, what I mean is um, a, uh, a democratic gov government is also able to behave quite nasty. Can I comment? Yeah. Please. Uh, there is a book on that uh, by um, Nicola Gensen on yeah. the post war Soviet famine yeah. in the historical uh, context. And um, I would agree with him in saying that, and actually, yeah, he mentions also Truman. Uh, it, it was a little bit more complicated, I think. Um, it was not only. Truman or administration, it was also a pressure. America was a democracy, not a perfect one. You, we can see what's happening there. Uh, but, but still, uh, it, it was a democracy, so it, it was a pressure from the society, from the former veterans of the war, to press for more consumption. So there is an offer, I think, uh, I don't remember now the, 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 uh, the, the offer, but uh, uh, he, he gives uh, uh, evidence on that, that actually America decided to give more grain to, uh, to raise more pigs, because you know, there was a pressure from the society. They don't want to accept these limitations and rationing during the war. So, but, but, but in terms of helping the uh, uh, Soviet Union, uh, first of all, uh, it was about the, um, uh, the, the, the aid, uh, the, land lease. the land lease program, sorry, yeah, uh, it, which was topped at that time. But act and actually, uh, this is not totally true because Ukraine and Belarus, the two republics, not Moldova, uh, received American grain through United Nations rehabilitation, uh, well, about one, 100 uh, uh, million uh, dollars aid less than, uh, you know, the Hoover in the 20s, but still, and, I th and here it's, it's more difficult. And, and, and first of all, I think Stalin is responsible for not, uh, uh, for prohibiting actually to use the word famine in the press, but also in the party documents I, I deal with. 
it was a it was a crime to say there is a famine, and I'm I, I will stop here by saying that after the the war, uh, the the phenomenon of the famine in the Soviet Union is more uh, delicate to discuss about it and to recognize because it's after the Second World War when the famine was already associated with Nazi extermination policies, one of the forms of of, of, of extermination. So that's why. Uh, okay. Yeah, Mr. Keller. Yes, um, uh, I would like to say that we are may maybe going on uh, on the very more or slippery slope of uh, uh, still seeing. I, I think this is our, our main challenge and problem. It is very, very clear, clearly seen on this example that you see the main, the bulk of victims of communist dictatorships were produced from famine. And uh, so Western democracies are co-responsible for this famine because they didn't deliver food for them. So we absolutely ignore the criminal essence of these dictatorships because Stalin produced artificially famine in Ukraine and the other parts of the Soviet Union because he sold grain to the West to buy arms for his aggression, arms to attack other nations and arms to suppress uh, his own population. So it has nothing to do with Western aid. And all, always providing aid to such dictatorships, it's 99% it's, uh, sure that this aid will not go to the, those in need because of the criminal nature of the rulers. They don't care about their people. And we see today the same about, unfortunately, the same continuity uh, in, in Russia. Don't care about their own people. You can see this in, in the example of Russian prisoners of war after the defeat of Hitler. They were freed to be deported to Soviet Gulag immediately because they were guilty of having survived. It was seen as betrayal. Um, they should have been dead. Instead, they dared to survive. So they had to be punished. If this is not a proof of criminal nature of communist rulers, I, I don't know what, what is it. Uh, they were sent to filtration camps. And 15% of the filtration camp population was actually punished. And this is data from one German researcher and one Russian researcher on the same topic. Dr. Kaminsky. Yeah, I don't want to deepen this very specific discussion, but I thought if we would have this discussion in Western Europe or in Western Germany, nobody would understand any word. <laughs> and I think this is a problem. No, uh, for, um, because this is, uh, on one hand side, this is very specific, and we could discuss here about Holodomor, ours and ours, and, and my opinion about that is a bit different from yours. <laughs> so, but, but I don't think that we can catch the point of the problem of the divided European memory. And, and for me, the, the main point is that there's a, a great lack of information and of knowledge in Western, in Western Europe and in Western Germany um, about what does communism mean, and we have a we have a kind of romanticism of commun of communism, which is not linked to communist crimes, uh, and which claims that communism shouldn't be equalized with communist crimes or communist regimes. Yeah. Le passé d'une illusion, yeah. like the famous book. Our Polish colleague, yes, okay. finally. Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, for Poland, obviously, this, uh, the Hitler-Stalin pact is of immense importance because it's, uh, well, on one hand, it ended the Second Republic of Poland, which began with, uh, among others, with the Polish-Soviet War, which is uh, one of the most important realms of memory for us, and it ended the free 20 years. Uh, and it, it is perceived, and it was, in fact, the fourth partition of Poland. Um, and on the other hand, it not only ended up with uh, huge losses, because as it is um, 
uh, assessed by the Polish Institute of uh, National Remembrance, there were uh, around 1.8 a million um, uh, victims of communism, out of which 1.6 uh, were the victims of the only of the years 1939 until 1941, um, which which shows that the first uh, Soviet occupation was very cruel. Um, then, uh, after 1945, the system was changing. Uh, with the first Stalinist years, and then uh, it got much, much milder, as in other countries as well, with just some hot spots in, in their histories. Um, and therefore, since it happened so uh, long ago, because we are talking about the 40s or the 50s, um, there are much uh, less witnesses than of the 1970s, for example, when we got a lot of credits from West, and it was well, let's say Poland was up to some moment flourishing. Uh, and that's why we have also this nost nostalgia, uh, not only in Poland, but also in other countries, of course. Um, um, but that's the, um, the, the, the Polish uh, topic. I come from an international institution, that is the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity, where Poland is just one of five countries. Um, and we, uh, our aim is to promote um, history about the 20th century, the totalitarian regimes, and therefore we show um, not only the uh, heritage of communism, but also of um, Nazism, so that Europeans, not only the Central Europeans, can understand better what actually happened. So uh, one of my impressions from today, uh, we went to the Patare prison, um, and so how disastrous, how cruel it was. But on the other hand, in June, we went to Fort Brandung in Belgium, where we had nearby in Brussels, we had a conference on the um, violence in 20th century Europe, uh, 20th century history of Europe. Um, and there we learned uh, about the cruelty of the Nazi Germans against the Belgians. So uh, I guess one of the ways is to promote the knowledge that actually what happened on 23rd of August 1939 was not only uh, against um, the Central Eastern Europe, but in fact, although that was written exactly in the secret protocol, but, but in fact it uh, influenced not only the, this region, but the whole of Europe, and in fact it was a global scale, right? And so that's one of the things we should show. Um, and then there are different types of memory, right? Um, there is the communicative memory, as Jan Asman says, that is the memory of the witnesses, which is then um, this, uh, um, uh, told their, their children and grandchildren. And that is something which, of course, uh, deals only with us from this region of Europe. But then there is also cultural memory, a uh, memory which is uh, taught at schools, from books, um, media, and so on. And this is um, very important that now, in fact, in Western Europe, only the um, cultural mem memory is possible, especially that we have a lot of immigrants, people who uh, joined Europe after all these uh, difficult experiences. And now we need to not only teach the Europeans, but also our, well, new Europeans, so to say. That's one of the uh, goals for the future years, I believe. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> one fact in relation to the uh, Hitler-Stalin pact, not widely known, is that up to the beginning of the German-Soviet war, the Soviet side killed more people than the German side. It's uh, famous, uh, the team of his yeah, yeah, yeah. that actually yeah. if you take, uh, you know, the, the number of the... Or the, or the people uh, killed by, by Stalin during peacetime, he mm -hmm. killed more than, than Hitler, which is kind of a, at the level of, you know, be scandalous. Yeah. But, but it's a good point, actually. Yeah, yeah. And actually, those figures were known before Snyder's book, of course. Yeah, yeah. sure. He is not original. And <laughs> no, he's, he's he is not. He's a little bit bolder than others. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's true. So, yeah. Professor Kasakamp. 
any more to add <laughs> from your Canadian Estonian perspective? You are still well, in I Canada, had, Canada mm -hmm. uh, but I, time. I had the pleasure to so. share the stage with Timothy Schneider in, in Tallinn a few years ago with uh, mm -hmm. President Ilves, and, and I believe it was part of this uh, network uh, again. And it, and it is. Uh, Timothy Schneider is, I think, a person who Eastern Europeans value very highly. He's because, uh, yes, <laughs> but uh, in Estonia and certainly elsewhere, because it really is, um, uh, it's a point which, uh, and uh, Darvel, who's here, uh, made in his recent interview that history isn't a rigid science, but it's an art, and it's an art of communicating, and it's art, an art of writing, and Timothy Schneider is, is able to do so, and it's, we can hold all sorts of conferences and have all sorts of research papers, but to have one brilliant uh, author with authority who can provocatively, but still in a sort of very readable, bestseller-like fashion, get across these ideas, uh, that promotes sort of our cause, which I think most of us here share, um, in a much more effective manner than, uh, than any number of, of seminars. Uh, um, but uh, I would also go back to your very first point, Olaf, about the, the common history. And I, and I agree with you completely there. It's, uh, of course, everything we do in the European Union, we think of more common policies, more common foreign security policy, defense, uh, finance, whatever. But uh, history, there have been strivings for that in the European Union before the European Union was even a, the European Union, when it was still the, the uh, economic community. First attempts between uh, French and German historians to find uh, writing textbooks together. There are attempts, I know, by Poles and Germans to, to do the same. It's, it's a noble goal. I mean, it's worth striving for. But it's not something that I think is uh, achievable. It's an interesting exercise to get people involved in it and people who read it to uh, see the multifaceted nature of history. But it can never be achieved, just like building communism can never be achieved. And we've, and we've even seen, uh, looking at it closer from a Baltic perspective, you, many of you here in the room know the very first history of the Baltic states, which was written by a collective group of Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian historians funded by the European Commission. And it's uh, quite, a, quite a patchwork in even getting a common Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian point of view. Maybe they could characterize Stalin and Hitler in a similar common fashion. But when it came to characterizing their own business, such as who played a larger role in 1919 in defeating the, the Germans in, in Latvia? Was it the Estonians or the Latvians? And immediately run into uh, questions of an interpretation. So uh, common history is something that is uh, a European perspective, is, is something that uh, is enjoyable and interesting uh, and, and useful as a sort of mental exercise to engage in. But uh, having a real valuable result from it, I share your doubts. Yeah. Well, Please. I'm not sure if we really need a common version, one version of uh, history. It's enough if we know about the different versions, at least, even at least in bilateral yeah. relations. And you mentioned the textbook commissions, which is in a very interesting point, actually. Um, at least to me, because I was working for the Polish-German textbook commission, and uh, the one all published. It, it has time. already published the already first published. volume. Okay. Now the the uh, idea we adopted was not to uh, get one version, but in cases where, uh, like uh, the 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 issue of the Teutonic Order and its relevance in Poland. Um, then we, if there are two versions, then we simply write two versions. 
um, and that, that will be also adopted in the last volume, that is the 20th century, which is still, still being worked on. So, well, nobody can see Most it now. difficult will be on the Second World War. Not only, the like medieval the ages German as well, actually. Version. Now, um, the, the textbook commissions are an interesting, uh, actually, point, because there was also the, the um, German-Russian textbook in 2015. One of the most difficult points where they did not reach uh, agreement was actually the Hitler-Stalin pact. And they, uh, they saw it in two different ways, the reasons and the results. Um, and so they wrote two versions, simply, um, in the same book. So that's, well, I, I, I don't necessarily have to agree with the Russian version, but it's good to show that why and that someone thinks in a def diff different way and why, simply. Mr. Kellam, please. Yes, and, uh, about common history. I've not put uh, historians in the straitjacket of writing a common history. So uh, it's, it's imp in not practical, it's, it's impossible actually. You always uh, will retain different points of view in analyzing history, in, in, in discussing the problems. I would put in it in a more, more straightforward and simple way. We need a common awareness that they were victims, that they were massive crimes, and that these crimes need to be addressed, that these, that, that, and perpetrators of these crimes were clearly criminals. Uh, I think that is our idea. And uh, the problem is, when I came to the European Parliament, I, we had a very, very nice lady from Austria, head of Austrian delegation, was absolutely innocent. Oh, you, you had such problems in Estonia, in the Baltic states. We, we couldn't believe. And, and uh, this, uh, this is devastating, such lack of information, lack of interest. That, that's, that's why we need to find a way how to tell our colleagues, our, our friends in different parts of Europe what has happened, because here is, is actually inequality. This is reflected also in the new uh, uh, European House of History, which was initiated by the European Parliament, which was opened uh, uh, this summer. But you can still the see Marx and Engels, even Bakunin, the founder of anarchism, as positive figures. Oh, they, they meant well, but they, they used two radical methods, and then that was it. Two radical methods means millions of people killed. And so we, we need to have this moral discernment. discernment. Uh, I am very much worried about, uh, about the way that uh, we, we treat, yes, in every democratic state, in every rule of law society, there's corruption, deception, uh, uh, lack, lack of retreating from, from uh, clear principles, but still there's a basic difference between open societies and, and, and totalitarian societies. Yeah, I would, uh, if, if you let me. Okay. Okay. I, I was visiting actually the museum uh, ten, years, uh, 10 days ago, Goran and uh, uh, Niela Winkelmann on the platform. We, we met 20 people from the platform. It was a short notice and, uh, 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 and I, I, I would agree with you, not only Marx, uh, yeah, Marx is a part of European history, but the way you presented it, yeah, with uh, class struggle, and uh, of course, it's not the and there are other problems like after the Second World War, Eastern Europe, you know, it was the end of the of the uh, Nazi tyranny, and the East Europeans uh, get under the Soviet control, which is which is on on the edge, let's say. Control is more neutral. Tyranny is very bad, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are other uh, outrageous, if not uh, scandalous. Uh, like saying in other contexts also about that period that uh, Western Europe became a part of the free world, but East Europeans 
have chosen to be a part of the Soviet. And other, a lot of, you don't have uh, any mentioning of the uh, uh, Hungarian Revolution of 56, uh, uh, Prague Spring, uh, something about Solidarność, I don't know. There the Poles were a little bit uh, overrepresented there. And actually, uh, <laughs> actually it's, 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 it's also uh, uh, difficult to understand because uh, there, are, there, there, there were represented in the board of the directors that were uh, responsible for the final narrative of this. Uh, uh, some some respected persons, uh, Mr. Borodjay, who yes. is very a friend of Germans, and um, and, 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 and 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 a respect uh, without irony, a respected uh, historian. And I don't know how it came to to this uh, version, which we are trying with our platform to to improve. Hopefully, will uh, will succeed. Well, I, I, I've, I also saw this museum and I have different sort of impressions. One of them is that, the, for example, the role of the church is lacking. So we can uh, have a long discussion about the, the, this uh, exhibition. However, there is, uh, and that's true, that communism after the Second World War is kind of, uh, there, there is a lot of about everyday life. Um, it's simply it's, too much, I would say, it's in the positive sense. It's in a way that you might understand. It was simply a different version, a different way of living, right? Different conditions, and that's all. However, um, on the other hand, the, both regimes in the interwar period are presented in a very good way, I believe, because it's exactly parallel. You can see uh, how. Yeah, cool but still, these sorry. But so no, no, no mentioning about uh, Holodomor. No. Okay, you don't say yeah, Holodomor, okay. but say Soviet famine at least. Mm. So it's a big, big problem with the with the concept of this. The other issue that is and a lot of money, million, millions of euro. Well, the other problem is that there there is a lot of content uh, hidden in these small captions. So. There, it might be there, but you couldn't find it simply. We, but we, if you can't find it, then it means that... It's more like we had Yedbavne, you said, uh, the Poles uh, exhibition. You have Yedbavne there, but you don't have explanation what yeah, it means. And who was the perpetrator? Who are the perpetrator in the Yedbavne? So a lot of kind of... This is manipulation. Uh, this is not... Yeah. I like the discussion very much because... Um, I think every one of us, if we would have, if we would have had the, the opportunity to make this exhibition in the House of European History, it would it would be very different. Even yes. that, I suppose we have a we have a common ground on what we believe is important in in, in history to to show, and and I thought. What you describe about this, this exhibition, I have been in a different museum. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but I think this is, this is good because it, it provokes discussion. And, and I will bring you an example with, a, with another German colleague. Um, we talked, uh, we, we, he was also in this museum, and when we met in Berlin, he, he was very outraged and he said to me, this exhibition is about bashing the Soviet Union. You believe that this exhibition is too, harm, too harmless mm -hmm. to Soviet Union. So you can see every, everybody going in this exhibition is coming out with a very different impression from uh, what's about there. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, But for me, it was really interesting, and I asked him, what do you mean with bashing Soviet Union? Um, what is that for you to tell the truth about the crimes, or what does it mean bashing Soviet Union in this exhibition? Yeah, no one's concerned about yeah. bashing Nazi <laughs> Germany. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but the Soviet Union saved Europe from fascism, mm. so. That's why, right, yeah. <laughs> They are immune of uh, yeah, yeah. everything they are doing. It's good. <clears throat> no, but um, returning to the victims of communism, I 
<clears throat> I think uh, one reason why um, a common European narrative that does not exist is uh, simply that in popular culture, film, television, on the internet, on Facebook, in Western European media channels, the topic does not really exist at all. Or it is a minor topic of some minority which came recently to our country from Poland or... Uh, and, and one of the explanation, all yeah, of yeah. is an Applebaum is saying in yeah, the introduction yeah. of, of Gulag, you don't have too many visual uh, uh, materials on communism, on, on crime of communism, and you have a lot on the crimes of Nazism, because, you know, the exhibition on Holocaust in forty in eighty four, I think, in Germany, based mm. on the on the letters and, and pictures sent home by the uh, Wehrmacht soldiers, and, uh, more like the Americans more recently in Iraq, you know, taking uh, to show and to 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 boast that they killed that and that and that. So you have a lot of, you know, the state also, you know, take care about you know taking pictures. And, and Auschwitz liberated and and uh, used. and you don't have on Kolomar, you don't have on uh, uh, because of uh, prohibition of photographs and, and uh, it's too far away. First of all, and, and all second, and the Soviet Union was simply too poor. So nearly every German soldier, like my grandfather, um, had a small camera with him to present later pictures of exotic places in Eastern Europe to children and grandchildren. But uh, the Soviet soldiers and, and Soviet security were not allowed to take photo cameras with them. And most of them did not possess any. So no footage, that's, that's true. Well, what we have are the personal files and the verdicts. So you just might have a nice exhibition of, of uh, pictures taken at the moment of arrest and below the verdict. Yeah, but they don't have uh, yeah, such okay. impact as yeah. having, you know. And I will say, hey, Zeki, prisoners. Yeah, yeah it looks like prisoners, yeah. It's, okay, that's he's true. tired, he's kind of, but you don't see the, the crime itself. So this is, this is one of the explanations why uh, oh, of course, ideology. Uh, well, but it's also, promising. it's also connected with the fact that actually Germany did a lot in order to, to present their history, to reconciliate. Um, whereas, well, in comparison to Soviet Union, um, yeah. it's totally well, different. Well, if you look into research of how the West German government dealt with World War II and, and remembrance and, and, and coming and then, to terms with it. It was, it and was, then it, 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 was, it was, it was stopped, a very long still, path. It was, of course. And there was, uh, there were first class and second class victims, first class um, larger countries and the Jews, Poland, Included into the first class of victims, uh, there was a quite quite a good settlement, but smaller NATO allies like the Netherlands or Belgium, Denmark, well, they get they received no word of regret and nothing, and s sometimes some compensation, and it was really late really late in time that the Democratic Federal Republic of Germany um, really came to terms with their smaller victims. So it's, it was not that good as it looks from now. It was ideal, yeah. but still yeah. uh, Russia did not... No, no, that's one percent no. of that. 
I, I think our, one of the problems we, we need to address very seriously is the paradigm of uh, uh, set, set by the winners of World War II, because the uh, uh, Soviet Union had changed sides in the meantime. Soviet Union aided Hitler in conquering Western Europe um, almost for one year and a half, providing Hitler with oil, grain, and all uh, political support, banning uh, French communists to fight against Hitler, and so on. And then was attacked and then occurred on the side of the, of the victors, uh, who were Nazis. But we need to realize that it was ousting devil with the help of, of Beelzebub. That is the equal evil. And I think uh, the British historian Gregor Dulles was one who, who analyzed the first direct costs of liberation of Eastern Europe, uh, excluding the Baltic states. And uh, his results is that during the first five years after 1945, first five years of peace under Soviet liberation, produced one million people killed in eastern part of Europe under, under the communist dictatorship. One million people killed. So the old Nazi camps were not enough to accommodate the new, new inhabitants. They had to start to, to build new camps and deport people, part of people, to the Soviet Union. It was interesting. We, we, initiated the new countries in the European Union in uh, 2005, when it was celebrated in Moscow, the uh, anniversary of victor victory in World War II. Uh, first time European Parliament initiated a debate on the consequences of World War II. And we succeeded to even to uh, uh, accept the resolution but I remember um, Jean-Claude Juncker, who was then, then heading Luxembourg presidency of the European Union. He came from Moscow when he attended the celebrations previous day. Then we had this debate on, on 10th of May 2005. And he told in his speech that I am thankful to the Red Army that they helped to liberate my home country, Luxembourg. Later on, I had the occasion to tell him that you must be happy that the Red Army did not liberate your country physically, <laughs> only indirectly. Otherwise, you would have, have had a second thought. Yeah, well, the only <laughs> country partly liberated by the Red Army and remaining independent was Yugoslavia. Mm. So, <laughs> but crimes were committed there too, yeah, locally. Uh, Still, the Slovenians yeah. did dis discover mass graves from yeah. But they were Tito's victims. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to pick up on what you were... Olaf, I just want to pick up on what you were saying. I had that same thought that uh, we here in this room are very frustrated uh, that uh, the victims of communism are not getting enough attention, and it's an uphill struggle. And it's, there's been some remarkable breakthroughs, and Don Gellam has been one of the leading figures in this, and Urmas is doing his bit now. Um, but putting that in the historical perspective with the comparison of the victims of Nazi Germany, that now that is such a, we're comparing ourselves with uh, how the victims of Nazi Germany get all the attention, victims of communism very little in contrast, but you're very right to point out that it took decades before not just the West Germans, but the rest of the world also took the Holocaust to be sort of a universal mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in, you think of American or British textbooks, now the Holocaust is a feature in every single history textbook. But that wasn't the case 20 years ago or 30 years ago. It's come about over a very long, long process. And Japan, that's the process. Japan still has and Japan, of course, is 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 <laughs> Asia. <laughs> Asia is in a much worse situation. Anyway. What I'm just trying to say is that, though we are frustrated, 
that parallel and looking how that is processed in the most, uh, in, a, in the best case of the most conscientious country coming to terms with its past, Germany, and how long that's taken, that should actually be encouraging for us, that it seems for us that it's not going quickly enough, but in the pers comparison with Germany, we, we should feel optimistic and encourage that over time. Not soon enough, of course, for the victims, but uh, the way it reaches, I mean, historians, uh, historians aren't the problem. Historians uh, are doing the research and are aware of all this, but reaching the sort of uh, the public in general. The German government was doing some kind of accounting when they could enter into the next step for, let's say, compensating uh, forced laborers. So when enough of them have died already, then they could start the scheme to compensate them. So, um, okay, please. Well, um, at, at the bottom, uh, you're absolutely right. It's enough to give two dates. I mean, the, the uh, symbolic French-German reconciliation at Verdun, that was 1986, actually, this, uh, this, uh, take, uh, this um, shaking of hands. And then the French-German textbook was uh, started being written in 2003 uh, only, whereas we started doing it with the Germans in 2008 or 9. Um, so that simply takes time. What, what I'm sorry is that we're losing the witnesses. <laughs> so we can wait with these uh, re reconciliations and processes probably, but the witnesses cannot. So it's so important to you know, record their uh, testimonies, etc. cetera. Um, as, and here I can just give you a very small example of the in-between project, which uh, my institution, the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity is doing. Um, it ta we're taking teenagers, so the, the next generation, to uh, different borderlands, and then we, get, we talk to witnesses of certain events, not only the Second World War, um, and we record, among others, their testimonies. Um, so I guess that's crucial, and then we can only work with it years later, right? Yeah, that, that would be made in parallel. Yeah. You have a lot of institutions, sure, sure, sure. Institute of National... Uh, memory and others. So it's, it's worse in other countries that, in my country, for instance, you don't have uh, the state in, involved in that. You have a state policy, so, yeah, I'm participating, and yeah, it's okay. But, but it's not prohibited, but not sustaining. Uh, so, so uh, Poland, in comparison, be, be happy. In comparison, <laughs> you should be happy. But we have a lot well, to do. <laughs> but you have a lot of uh, involvement of the state. And, uh, yeah, but the state partly also directs the politics of memory and the politics of history. So I would prefer to work in a country without a peace government. <clears throat> for my freedom of research and for my freedom to say stupid things, as I say, <laughs> regularly. Yeah, and uh, fortunately you are right when you, let's put uh, Ukrainian, uh, not criticizing only, only yeah. Russia. Yeah. Uh, Ukraine, you have a state-sponsored politics of memory, which is, which is bad, let's say, directly. It's like saying Antonescu was a hero, the Russians are bad, and Antonescu killed on, uh, not on purpose, because the Jews were actually, you know, agents of communists and so on and so on. So it's the same, so this is... This is European politics of memory. So that's why we need this concept, you know, in order to not let such uh, figures like Bandera to, to be a part of the, you know, of national pride and European yeah. memory, which is... Yeah, well, politics of memory. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, but I think historical research is one thing, but for me the most important is the political will to remember the victims. And... Mm -hmm. and um, and uh, uh, if I remember well, well, until 2004, when the former communist ruled countries uh, entered the European Union, on European Union scale, there were no discussions about communism and communist legacy. Um, so we are in, in year 14 or 13 to, to deal with that on, on European scale. But... Uh, 
to honor the victims, to organize uh, commemoration acts like today, to give victims uh, rehabilitation and compensation. For that, you don't need historical research. Um, mm -hmm. right. For this, right. you need political will mm -hmm. to give them, uh, to build monuments, to keep it alive, to, uh, uh, to broadcast memories, because my experience is that in Germany, where we have a really good uh, uh, historic infrastructure, we have uh, uh, good funding programs, the interest of most of the historians is not to research about communist crimes, even that there would be opportunities. It's there are other, for so, your career. So we, could, we can't wait that historians uh, discover the interest in communist crimes. I think first there should be the political will to, to say this is an important social issue and political issue for our societies. Good, but, but before you can start um, on a larger scale, uh, history and memory politics, you need to know what you are talking about. What I mean, for instance, in the Baltic states, in the early 1990s, the, the amount of knowledge of contemporary history, the real footwork of archival work, has not yet been done. So it took a bit more than a decade, and a lot of the colleagues who have done the work and Yes, we I, 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 don't, I don't say that we beef, don't need beef, historical beef. research, but I don't Before. say that this is a that this uh, this is a first step, and then the other steps no. are coming. Um, uh, uh, okay, it mm. it can be uh, parallel, but mm. if you, for instance, do not know anything about the amount of number of victims, or if your if your um, event is, is, is not properly researched and you don't know whether it's two million or five million famine victims, or seven or 14 in the Great Famine. Yeah, yeah. but this so is statistics. You need this basic research. For me, this is the st statistics. Otherwise. And it no. doesn't matter if there are two million or seven million. It doesn't matter for remembrance. You have to remember, you have to remember even if there are only 20,000. To know if there are 7 million, this is, this is really a, an historical this, interesting well, question. It's, it's, but to remember the victims, yeah, this is I, not important. I took the number, just to illustrate, in the case of the Great Famine, one has to ask, man-made or not, intended, not intended, what was the influence of the weather, and so on. Objective other, factors, there are uh, objectives other, also. Otherwise, you can't come to any judgment, but to any proper judgment, to any fair judgment, for the victims and for the possible perpetrators. But, but in terms of the, the numbers of the uh, it's, it's important to know the, the number because this competition for higher uh, numbers, this is discrediting our, our, our work because, you know, in, in Moldova, for instance, you have around uh, um, 80,000 uh, deportees, yes, and during the public commemorations uh, at the monument of the deportees, the political party who are capitalizing on that are saying one million and this is the minimal. So I think we should uh, stick to, to minimal numbers that could be documented than to inflate them uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and discredit the, 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 the topic. That's exactly the, the thing that there are, I mean, these are two levels which are, which, which are necessary. That is, one is research and the other is, uh, well, commemoration together with uh, political influence. That is, we need politicians in order to foster some initiatives like even the 23rd of August. Um, but on the other hand, we need historians who will do their uh, uh, research in the field 
Um, but you know, when it comes to numbers, even the Spanish flu, which we all know about, the, the numbers vary from 20 million to 100 million uh, uh, around Not the world. Not 100, but 20. Well, no, no, up to 100 uh, around the world. A world, yeah. Yeah, Europe and that was 20. worldwide. Um, world, yeah. So, and it's totally forgotten. On the other hand. Um, nobody remembers yeah, yeah. about the Spanish it's flu. Marginal. It's uh, marginal. So, it's yeah. not forgotten, it's marginal. It's marginal. But we, we so do have hundreds of thousands of concrete cases, mm. people who have been uh, suppressed, killed, imprisoned, deported. Mr. Ispu is here. Yeah. He is living testimony of the atrocities of the communist regime. I, I think it is very, very dangerous to look for excuses, not to face politically mm. and morally the truth. The truth is that there were ma mass of victims uh, produced by communist regimes, and first of all, we need to give a political and moral assessment mm. of these crimes. Mm. And to see these crimes as equal to those victims which was, was uh, caused by, by the Nazi regime and the others. I think it is, uh, our task is as simple as that. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you very much. Now I have to execute my powers as a moderator. To open the floor for discussion, we have 30 minutes. And please speak always into the microphone. Would you start, please? Thank you very much. Um, I think this has been an incredibly interesting panel from the point of view of how we can digress and how we can go off on tangents and have little side issues and side arguments. We need to focus on the real issue, which is Hitler and Stalin were allies. They worked together. They doomed Europe to being divided, to there being a war and all of the horrible consequences that came of this. The fact that the alliance didn't last does not matter. They were allies. And now we have to deal with the consequences. One aspect is that we have to look at why is this discrepancy where we have a sense that some victims are less equal than others. This is something that has many reasons. There have been many books written about this analysis. I would recommend to the professors Stephen Koch, a book named Double Lives, talks about the case of Willy Munzenberg. I think it would be very instructional. But to the point at hand, we today are living in this world with all the consequences of what happened many years ago. A terrible regime was unleashed on the world, and this regime has clothed itself in a holier-than-thou cloak saying, I defeated Hitler. Putin has stood up and said, when there were trials of Soviet war criminals, human rights violators in the Baltic states, oh, how dare you put these people on trial? They helped to defeat Hitler, as if that excuses, excuses everything. We must stick to the issue at hand to have the equal assessment of the two regimes, the consequences, the moral assessment, and assessing who should carry some blame, because there are still perpetrators alive. Thank you very much. I could go I, on for a long time, <laughs> but I, think, I will stop I, here. I think this was more a comment than uh, a, a question to one of It my wasn't uh, supposed to be a question. Colleagues. I thought this was for comments. Yeah, and okay, the but please. Press officer in the Foreign Ministry, and before that, uh, she was in America fighting for the Baltic cause. Thank you. Uh, well, usually it's said that uh, wars are too complicated and too dangerous to leave to the military. Apparently history is too dangerous to leave to historians. Uh, 
I agree totally. This is one of the first times I agree with Anna. We, we need to have a... Poli yeah, we don't agree very often. We disagree, and, and our friends anyway. It is time that we take the political decisions. It's up to the, the politicians. I'm only an ex-politician. But this, this needs to be dealt with, especially in what is called Western Europe, where a lot of collaborators existed during the communist days for economical reasons, for ideological reasons, and especially among your colleagues in, in the so-called Western countries. The academia was totally socialist all over the Nordic countries and, and many others as well. And in Britain, it's not even okay to talk about remembering uh, the victims of communism because they say we should leave it to the historians, the British politicians even. So uh, we do have a big task, but we need to educate the young. The platform has managed to have a, a, a book for reader for primary schools, which are 30 stories of victims of one or both regimes. We have a board game where you can play how to flee over the Iron Curtain. Perfectly, I tested it on my teenagers. They even think it's good, but you can start from eight, 10 years. And we need more of these things. And we need ideas, and we also need ideas how to get financing so we can spread it wider. The reader is translated to several languages. The board game will be translated. We get some help from our Polish friends in the IPN with these things. But to, to, the material is here. The knowledge is here. But we need actually political decision and money to do it. That was also a comment, not a question. <laughs> Please. May I con continue with my friend uh, Göran? Yes, we're both from the West and from the Netherlands, and when I uh, listen to the whole conversation, there is absolutely, absolutely in my country no uh, affection with this topic. And even when I start to talk about the date 23rd of August, and I start to, to talk about, I, I start the, the two words, Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, they tell, what are you telling here? And this not the Dutch this not the Dutch language anymore. It sounds some Russian. They absolutely don't understand. And now I do it the other eyes round. I start about the Day of Europe. What is Day of Europe? Nobody knows. I said you ought to know. It's the ninth of May. Ni the, the, the ninth of May. They give a question. Well, what is that? Yes. Then they invented that coal and steel belong together. And this is, this is the guarantee for the safety for Europe. That's what Mrs. Schumann told us. But it's absolutely nonsense in this time of the hybrid war. The hybrid war. Steel and coal, dirty coal, cannot help us. So then I have a bridge to go to the alternative, the 23rd of August. Hmm. And I will give you some practical advice. And we had them already for Göran, but there's something... something Still, we have a weapon, or weapon, we have self and other document. You told me the documents of the Prague Declaration. We have this, this, um, um, this the 9th, uh, 2009, this what in the European Parliament, this resolution. But there's another document. This is the Warsaw Declaration of 2011. And that started the commemorations of the 23rd of August. And this document was signed also by Western countries like Sweden, Greece, Portugal, Spain, but not Holland, for instance. What I've done, I've sent this declaration to my government, to the Ministry of Justice. I sent them the copies that it's not um, signed by Eastern European countries, but also Western European countries. What is your opinion about this document. And I was gladly surprised they fully agreed. And I put this document on my website. So I think what we have to do to, um, uh, to get more of these letters, that is, that is Warsaw Declaration. You know the Warsaw Declaration? You don't know? I'm the only one who knows the Warsaw Declaration. Oh, I'm glad there are two they know. The Warsaw Declaration declares that that the, that the resolution from 2009, we fully, we fully agree. And I think that was the first commemoration in Warsaw in 2011. 
And now we have 2011, 2017 here in, um, uh, in Tallinn. And we I had in Vilnius also, two or three years ago when it was Lithuania. Yes, now you start remembering. 2013. Yes, okay. And so we have more. I, th Anila I think was there. we have more of this. We have to use this document. That's my advice. Not a comment, but an advice. <laughs> Sure. Two comments, one advice. <laughs> Is there any question? Great. <laughs> Let's hope. <Yeah. laughs> Hello, thank you. I'd like to ask a question finally, actually, after all. You know, when I think again of the Russian perspective that was touched briefly, there is a great example of civil society activities in Moscow, especially in other big cities. They have this project called uh, the Least Address. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When they place a small label on the Sydney apartment address. house where the person was arrested and then sent to, say, Gulag or was killed. Or, Inspired the, from the Holocaust, what they did yeah, in yeah, Germany. Yeah. And uh, certainly they face lots of obstacles and things. But uh, then again, it's... I believe it's more efficient, actually, than any monument or any museum, since to museum you have to go to. And this label is something you see your face every day when you go to work and then you go back home, or maybe twice. And uh, this is something which is, you know, uh, absolutely inevitable for all the generations, since it's everybody passing the same label and seeing it and can ask uh, your grandparents also. But the problem is that this thing can work only in downtowns of uh, big cities. And uh, you cannot place one somewhere in a random village. And then if we think that actually the most of the victims came from rural areas, and we then again end up with the statistics of the millions, we can identify those who were easily identified, those who were, uh, say, trialed or executed in towns and cities. And uh, their records are very good. I mean, for historians to, to go to archive, but when it comes to rural areas, it's, it's not that good already. And even if it is existing, you cannot place it somewhere to a visible spot for everybody to see and to think of. So uh, we then again end up with this anonymity of most of the victims. How could you maybe elaborate on this issue of anonymity? Thank you. Um. In case of the Soviet Union, during collectivization, you will have a couple of unknown victims getting killed in, during all the upheaval in the countryside. But people who were regularly arrested received their personal file, and the, their personal files had to be stored uh, forever. So, in the personal files, usually the cause of arrest and further information uh, is represented. So it depends definitely on the region or on uh, the republic how, how many percent of the personal files are still preserved but uh, uh, I guess in Estonia, it's more than 95%. Something like this. And in, in some other places, 90%, 80%. So you, <clears throat> you can identify most of the people uh, through the archives. Mm. But I think but, part of this is this yeah. anonymity yeah. is certainly a problem with yeah. uh, victims of, of Soviet communism. Um, and you can think how effectively, uh, well, successfully, uh, Holocaust victims have been um, uh, not brought to life, but how their lives have been personalizing. The best example, of course, is the Anne Frank uh, diary and the Anne Frank house in, in Holland, that it's become a tourist site. It's, it's uh, something, her diaries are something which are in school curricula for kids to read it. So this one particular victim has become, sort of her story has become a symbol for the whole thing. And she is very well known to people of all ages and all countries. Uh, and to find a similar compelling 
victim and story to bring alive again, uh, in the case of communism, would be one uh, way to go about this. Well, Hiroaki Kuromiya has uh, compiled a book called The Whisperers, which is mm -hmm. based on materials of uh, the arrested and later perished. Mm -hmm. And it's quite express, impressive. So you've got an image of the person um, being killed. Um, I think this is a very important point you, you, you pointed out um, about the anonymity of the victims. And on the other hand, the anonymity of the perpetrators. But uh, I, I, I would bring two examples from, from Germany. I, I would say in the last 10, 20 years it started in Germany um, that people said it's not enough to have one example, Anne Frank, and this is one example who stands for all. Um, um, since several years, um, a lot of people are researching the names and the birth and death dates, if it is possible to research. And on behalf of the documents, I'm very, very, very cautious about that. Because what we find in the Soviet files, you can't you can't take it for 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 reality. Um, they, they, uh, uh, they constructed they constructed. Um, it's a uh, special language. Yeah. You so uh, read um, between lines. So um, and 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 we in Germany we are uh, there are two um, two projects I would like to uh, um, to cite. Uh, one are. Uh, one project is um, about uh, um, after the uh, after GDR was founded in 1949, uh, GDR handled over more than 1,000 Germans to the Soviet to Soviet Union, and they were shot in Moscow. This was against the East German Constitution, but we all know that the Constitution was not worth the pa was not worth the paper uh, it was printed on. So they were shot in, in Moscow, and nobody knows that. And in 2008, I think, we had a common project with Memorial in Moscow because they found these names of Germans in the Soviet files. Mm. And they called us and said, oh, we found here a lot of, of Germans. What shall we do? And we said, let's, uh, let's name them and let's research their biographies. And the interesting point is that nobody knew that, and we published this book and we published a film about these over 1,000 victims, which lay on which lay on the Donskoye Kladbyshe Donskoye um, Friedhof. What's the name? Cemetery. 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 Yes. Um, uh, and about this book and and the film, the families of these victims learn to know what happened to their family members. And when we published this book in Germany, uh, not a huge discussion, but at least a discussion started. And the first reaction was, yes, the, they were all not Nazis. They were all Nazis, and uh, they got what they what they had to what they had to get. And then we said, no, look into their biographies. And only, I, I think, 8% of these 1,000 really had a Nazi background. But the important thing was they were, not, they were not condemned to death for the Nazi background. Mm -hmm. The Nazi background was mentioned in the files, but they were condemned to death for anti-Soviet activities in the, in the late 40s. This is one example. And the other example is that we, we, we had uh, in East Germany as well, like in Estonia and all other mm -hmm. countries, we had huge Soviet uh, internment camps. Uh, spe so-called special camps. And the survivors of these camps, they are trying to get a kind of, of symbolic uh, gravestone for the deaf people. And so our foundation, we, we financed for nearly every of these Soviet camps uh, commemorative books with the names of the, uh, of the prisoners. And in one camp, the survivors said, no, this is not enough for, for us to have a book. We want to have on the mass graves a plague with all the names of the deaf people. 
And then uh, uh, th there started a discussion if this is adequate to name people which maybe have been Nazis or which maybe have collaborated with Nazis. And we can't be sure because in these camps there were also people who, who were Nazi. Sure. Most of the, of the Germans at that time were Nazis. So, but the, mo the people, the Russians mostly uh, um, uh, imprisoned uh, were people who were against Soviet power. And Nazi background was also in the background. And uh, there was a, a large dispute if it is okay to name these people. And I said, the whole time I said, this is, this is a kind of a gravestone. And it was Stalinist politics to erase the names of all these people. And, and we have to name these people. And then the historians can come and search about the background of these people and can say, but he did this or he did that or not. But at first, they, they have the right to have a gravestone. And these plagues, in that moment, are only to mark the tomb of these people and to give the, fam the families the opp opportunity to have a Yes, to have a place to grieve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Further questions? Yeah, please. Mario Tom, palun kas ma võin teile eesti keeles rääkida? Ja, aga palun uudake kuni kõik, okei, jah. Olgu. Olen üks neist, keda 49. aastal viidi Siberisse. Elasin seal viis aastat mullast augus ja läksin 12. aastaselt tööle karjakuna lehmalüpsjana. Koolis ei käinud. Elasime Väga huvitavas kohas. Asi on selles, et peale sõda toimunud küüditamised ja vangistamised praktiliselt lõppesid sellega, et need inimesed paigutati idapoole Semipalatinski poligonist ja vangid läänepoole Karakanda ümbrusesse Semipalatinski poligonist ja Nõukogude liidus öeldi, et meie oleme see praht rahvas. Meid isegi ei kõlba hävitada mahalaskmisega. Meid kiiritati seal, sest seal toimusid katsetused. Algas see 49. aastal, 29. augustil. Ja ÖRO on kuulutanud selle päeva aatom relva vastu võitlemise ja katsetuste vastu võitlemise päevaks. Kutsun üles see Euroopat, see päev ka Euroopas ära tähistada. Seda esiteks teiseks. 52. aastal pandi seal plahvatama Saharovi kihiline pomm, mis oli kõige raadioaktiivsem, mis üldse siia maani on plahvatama pandud. Jeltsin ja Nazarbaev kuulutasid selle ala 1200 kilometrit teameetris ökokatastrofi piirkonnaks. Mina olin sellest sündmusest 400 kilometri kaugusel. Mina sain oma sahmaka sealt kaela, sest osutusin sellel päeval olevat stepis. Ja soovitan teil vaadata filmi, Spielbergi filmi Maailmade sõda. Seal on näha torm. Vaad sellise tormi elasin mina steppis üle. Nii et ma kutsun kõiki liitma sellele sajale miljonile ohvrile, kellest täna siin räägiti. Veel kuus miljonit. Need on need inimesed, keda 
Sakharovi valemi järgi võib öelda, et need hukkusid nende Nõude Liidu tumapommi katsetuste tõttu. Ja kaks kolm korda rohkem on neid, kes sai kiiritada ja elasid kõik võimalike haigustega edasi. Mõned tulid nendest ka siia Eestisse tagasi. Miks ma sellest räägin? Sest ma näen iga päev oma poega. Minu poeg on verejärgi mutant. Ta ei ole emofiilik, aga tal veri ei hüübi. Kui tal on vaja hamast välja tõmmata, siis ta peab enne minema vere ülekannet tegema näiteks. Ja see tõttu ma ütlen, et kõik küüditatud, kõik vangid, kes Nõugde Liidus peale 44. aastat üldse küüditati, kõik said kaela omale selle saatuse. Tänan teid. Thank you very much for this personal memory. And it is, well... Historians are not always um, happy when they meet witnesses of history because we, we did not attend this, but um, in, in our circumstances, I think this was um, an interesting contribution. Does but, anybody want but to I comment? Think, uh, I would not agree. Uh, with you, but uh, yeah, yeah, I agree that uh, a lot of historians are reluctant to yeah. to take in uh, in perspective also the the, the view of the uh, of the, of the survivors. And uh, uh, but I, I I would say that we we agree with you that uh, um, there should be no uh, difference between the victims of the class uh, or crimes committed on class criteria and racial ethnic criteria. This is. This should be uh, uh, a basis of our understanding uh, and, and the politics of European politics of memory. Okay, thank you. Hola. Any? Yeah. No, I, I would. I would like to say. Um, the last comment reminds us of all that this is not history, that this is a life of a lot of people killed or still alive. And I think we shouldn't forget that. So, I see we have theoretically three and a half minutes more to discuss. But the audience looking tired and would like to attend the opening of the exhibition and join us all for dinner. But <coughs> if there are no other questions, furthermore, um, we will soon end be this meeting. Talking. Before the end, Mr. Uh, <coughs> Minister Reinsalu will have some concluding remarks. And after this, we will watch a short film, a really short film. So thank you very much for attending our discussion and the floor is yours. Uh, dear friends, um, I would like to see that uh, human rights and the basic uh, rights and freedoms which are granted for us by our birth. Those are not issue of compromise. And uh, an issue actually is not 
looking from the perspective of victims, whether one or other totalitarian ideology was harsher uh, in uh, comparison to other or not. It does not make the lost life coming back to a victim or millions of victims. And this is actually a core. When we are speaking about the common historical approach, we are not speaking about the big brothers of written history, by no, by no means. We are speaking about the relevance of the historical facts put to the framework of human rights and uh, concept of uh, unacceptance and condemnation of crimes against humanity. This is actually the core issue. This is an issue of uh, Greek logics. If the A is having is the same by the facts as B, then they are relevant. This is the core message. I'm very thankful also for the remarks uh, which were made about the importance of uh, time uh, in that study work. And I think uh, the call also for the European institutions to support uh, by any means uh, the platform of, uh, of uh, memory and uh, concerns. This is actually a very practical and wise call, I think, which will be uh, one of the echoes, I hope, uh, of this conference. And the second issue is also very important uh, academic cooperation of the memory institutions, which uh, we have seen. And the second element is also a cooperation framework of the countries. This is not a political issue, but it needs to be addressed also in the level of public institutions. This is actually an issue of not just uh, uh, referring to the history as such. This is an academic task, but this is actually a task of the democratic countries, democratic institutions to defend the values we believe in. Thank you very much.